Lamborghini's Hurricane Replacement is a twin-turbo V8 hybrid, all very un-Lambo, but it shares those features with the first Lamborghini ever designed solely for racing, and it revs to 10,000 RPM. Only two other V8 road cars have ever done that, on purpose anyway. So, how does the new Lamborghini do it? Let's get into it. Lamborghini's newest engine, dubbed the 634, has been officially announced, and it's incredible. That will power the Hurricane successor, which is due to be revealed on August the 16th at Pebble Beach. Supposedly, that's called the Temerario, which Lamborghini has trademarked. So we'll call it that until they tell us otherwise. But there's a problem when it comes to making a video about the Temerario. We don't know what it looks like. There aren't any official photos. So how do you make a video about a car when you can't show it? Well, one thing you can do is to get footage like this from a professional spy photographer. And if you want to do even better, you can hire a digital artist to make a rendering of what they think the car might look like based on those spy shots. So I told our producer to find an artist who could create a render of the Temerario. And this is what they came up with. Now that we know what the Temerario looks like, sort of, let's talk about that engine, the 634. <laughs> and what it will be replacing. It's a huge departure from the Hurricane, or for that matter, any Lamborghini. The Hurricane has been around for 10 years. It's got a V10 engine co-developed with Audi. That's an updated version of the V10 from its predecessor, the Gallardo, but its roots go all the way back to the P140 prototype from 1988, the first Lambo ever with a V10. In spite of that engine's age, the Hurricane makes 631 horsepower, revs to 8,500 RPM, and delivers a 0 to 60 of just 2.5 seconds. That's helped make the Hurricane the best selling Lamborghini of all time, with over 20,000 sold. If you don't count the Urus, which sold 30,000 units, but that's an SUV sharing a platform with the Audi Q7, the Q8, the Bentley Bentayga, Porsche Cayenne, and the Volkswagen Touareg. And it weighs as much as a Hurricane being driven by a bison. So we're gonna ignore it and get back to the real Lambos. The Hurricane outsold its big brother, the Aventador, nearly two to one which makes sense because the Hurricane is half the price. And Lamborghini needs something really special to replace it. Their answer, the Temerario, looks pretty much what you'd expect from Lamborghini, at least in the spy photos. But to make a great Lambo, looks aren't everything. What's inside counts too. Just imagine if they tried putting a four cylinder in the Temerario. No need to worry about that though, because it'll have a V8. And from any other supercar company, a V8 would be totally normal. But as we know, Lamborghini isn't normal. Since Lamborghini began making cars in 1963, most of those have used some version of their flagship V12 engine. That includes all the famous models, the Miura, Countach, LM002, Diablo, Murcielago, and the Aventador, plus dozens of limited production vehicles. Even the heart of the Revelto with 814 horsepower is an evolution of that original V12. The V10 in the Hurricane and the Gallardo has always been the oddball. And unless you have a long memory or are especially nerdy for Lamborghinis, you might struggle to come up with a V8 model. But there were a few in the 70s and 80s. The Urico, the Silhouette, and the Yelpa. That was like an adorable little Countach that actually didn't sell very well. But combined, less than 1,200 Lamborghinis were ever made with a V8. So the Temerario getting a V8 is a big deal. And it gets even stranger because it's a twin turbo hybrid. And Lamborghini has never done that before with one exception. Okay, hang on, we're still ignoring the Urus. Its twin turbo V8 is a modified Audi engine and its hybrid system comes from the Porsche Cayenne. It really is the most un-Lamborghini Lamborghini ever made. And the only real Lamborghini with a twin turbo hybrid V8 is the SC63 LMDH, designed for Le Mans prototype racing. That's also the first Lamborghini designed from the ground up as a race car, and includes their first engine designed specifically for motorsport. Apparently, Lamborghini, which has always been the crazy uncle of supercar makers, has become a serious performance engineering company. But to prove they still know how to party, they're gonna put that race engine into a road car. 
car. And it will be joining some pretty impressive company. The 634 is one of just three production V8s capable of reaching 10,000 RPM. And one of those is found in the Zynga 21C. That's a $2.3 million hypercar with a bespoke 950 horsepower V8 capable of revving to 11,000 RPM. The 21C just broke the all-time record for the fastest production car at the Goodwood Festival Hill Climb. Zynga has yet to deliver any customer cars, but they claim that will begin in just a few months. The other member of the 10K Club is the Aerial Atom 500, which is less of a car and more of a roll cage with an engine. And its 500 horsepower V8 can rev to 10,600 RPM. But it's kind of cheating. The Atoms V8 is really two four-cylinder Suzuki motorcycle engines joined at the crank. And there's been loads of motorcycle engines that can exceed 10,000 RPM. Some can even break 20,000. And the Atom and the 21C employ one of the same tricks as those motorcycles. They keep the mass of their internal parts low. Engine parts move in two different ways. Parts like the crankshaft rotate. Rotating mass can be a problem, especially as that mass gets further away from the center of rotation. But a much bigger problem is the reciprocating parts. That's everything moving back and forth, like valves and pistons. When an engine is operating at a constant speed, the rotating parts are at a constant speed too. But the reciprocating parts are constantly changing speed. For every half rotation of the engine, each piston has to accelerate from a dead stop at one end of the cylinder then decelerate to a dead stop at the other end. And as the engine spins faster, the piston's rate of acceleration and deceleration increases. At 10,000 RPM, each piston has to travel fast enough to complete that entire start-stop journey about 330 times every single second. In other words, a piston goes from zero to as much as 95 miles per hour and back to zero again in three milliseconds. That constant acceleration and deceleration puts huge stress on the other components like connecting rods, which are often the weak link when an engine over revs. Sometimes getting to high revs is simple. Make all of the reciprocating parts as small as possible. A tiny engine has tiny pistons and tiny valves, which are all lightweight because they're small. That's how motorcycles, the Atom, the Zynga 21C actually do it. The Atom's V8 is just three liters and the 21C's is even smaller at 2.9. But the high revving Lamborghini 634 engine isn't especially tiny. At four liters, it's the same size as the V8 in the Ferrari SF90, but that can only rev to 8,000. To hit 10,000 RPM, the 634 employs a couple of tricks from its race car routes to overcome its reciprocating mass. Instead of making parts like pistons smaller, another way to cope with high revs is to make the other parts stronger. So the 634, like a lot of race engines, uses titanium connecting rods. Those are stronger than steel rods, so they can cope with the stress of a fast moving piston. Another way to deal with high revs is to reduce the reciprocating mass, but that doesn't have to mean making everything smaller. The connecting rods are actually also a part of the engine's reciprocating mass, and titanium com rods are about 30 30% lighter than steel rods. That means less stress on the crankshaft, the rod bolts, rod caps, and the bearings. Piston speed is another factor that limits engine speed. But the root of the problem is, once again, the stress caused by the rapidly reciprocating parts. Yet another way to reduce engine stress is to make the reciprocating parts slow down, like they would at lower RPMs. And you can do that without reducing engine speed by shortening the engine stroke. That's the total difference that the piston travels during one half rotation of the engine. The four liter V8 in the Ferrari SF90 has a stroke of 82 millimeters. At the red line, 8,000 RPM, each piston has an average speed of 22 meters per second. Lamborghini is 634 is derived from the engine in the SC63 race car. That has a stroke of 73 millimeters. So at the same engine speed, the 8,000 RPM, those pistons are traveling at just 19 meters per second. And another bit of race car tech that helps the 634 rev high is the top end. Like pistons, valves also reciprocate. They move from fully closed to fully open and then back again to closed. That makes them susceptible to similar problems of accelerating and decelerating mass at high engine speeds. But unlike pistons, valves aren't in constant motion. 
Each valve only opens once for every two rotations of the engine. The problem is getting them to open and close quickly and precisely enough to keep up with the engine speed. In a typical overhead cam engine, the camshaft lobes push against metal buckets sitting atop the valve stems. That movement compresses the valve's return spring, opening the valve. As the cam lobe rotates off of the bucket, the spring re-extends, closing the valve. And those buckets are necessary because the cam lobes can't push directly on the valve stems. They're too narrow and would gouge the smooth surface of the lobes as they rotate across the stem. But the buckets add reciprocating mass to the valves. That means that the spring has to be stronger in order to close the valve. And the resistance from the stronger spring means that it takes more force to open it. Instead of buckets, a finger follower valve train uses a rocker arm that pushes directly onto the valve stem. Eliminating the bucket reduces reciprocating mass by about 20% meaning the valves can open with less force and close more rapidly. These fingers create less friction and therefore less heat. Now, of course, not everything about race engines works for road cars. So the 634 makes one major change over the SC63's engine, and that's its hot V configuration. A V engine has two banks of cylinders, each with a hot side where the exhaust ports are and a cold side with the intake ports and most V engines have the cold sides facing each other inside the V and a single intake manifold and the hot sides are on the outside of the V. If that engine has turbos, those will be on the outside of the V as well. But a hot V engine does just the opposite. Those have two intake manifolds, one for each of the cold sides which are outside of the V and the hot sides of the cylinder banks face each other inside the V. And if there's turbos, those end up together on top of the engine, sort of tucked into the V. And one advantage of having both turbos together in the middle is that the entire engine is narrower and so keeps its weight closer to the center of the car. The exhaust manifolds can also be shorter, which reduces weight and it helps get exhaust gases to the turbines more quickly. In turn, that decreases spool up time and improves throttle response. That's especially nice on the street when you aren't constantly keeping the revs up like you might do on a racetrack. The path from compressor through the intercoolers and to the intake is shorter as well. That reduces turbo lag and further reduces total weight. And in spite of the name, Hot V actually has better thermal performance. By having the intake manifolds low and on the outside of the V, they're less affected by heat from the engine and the turbochargers. And if you look closely at the 634, you'll see that those intake manifolds are even made of plastic. And that's only possible because of how good the Hot V configuration is at keeping those cool. And that's the final piece to its high revving ability too. The faster an engine spins, the more heat it creates. So anything that keeps the temperature down will help it to spin faster. The sum of all the 634's parts is 789 horsepower. 158 more than the outgoing Hurricane, and just 25 less than the flagship V12 powered Revuelto. Yes, the Hurricane successor is losing two cylinders, but it gains a whole load of race car tech. The 634 is a huge departure for Lamborghini, but it's also a huge step forward. It demonstrates their new focus on engineering and that they're no longer just about making the flashiest supercars. And the 634 isn't just the first V8 twin turbo hybrid from Lamborghini. It's the first Lambo engine with racing pedigree. Ferruccio Lamborghini quite famously thought that motorsport was a waste of money. But does the 634 prove that he was wrong? Let me know what you think in the comments and thanks for watching.